Good afternoon, church. I want to praise the Lord. I want to praise the Lord that we are here. We can't complain. And all things give glory to God. Amen, amen, amen. I, well, the Lord has uh, impressed upon me to maybe share a little bit more about um, one of the doctrines that we have in, especially Adventist, actually in the Adventist church, because you will not find this doctrine anywhere else, which is called uh, the investigative judgment. What other name do we use in the church for this name? Do we know? There's another name we use. Pre-advent judgment, isn't it? Okay. Pre-advent judgment. And we'll understand why it's called the pre-advent judgment. Because pre means before, advent means Christ coming and judgment. That means this judgment we're talking about now is the one before Christ what? Comes back. Are we together? Okay. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, indeed, we want to welcome you into our hearts. Especially for me, Father in heaven, I pray that you speak through me. And I pray for your children so that this is not complicated at all. This is supposed to be good news. And I pray, Father in heaven, that this good news will not only remain in our hearts, but also we'll share it with our brothers and sisters out there. Give me the voice so that I can be able to speak the words that only you have put in my mouth. Thank you for hearing and answering up my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So like I said, more than any other doctrine, the investigative judgment doctrine is created what? Fear, isn't it? Because when you read Daniel um, chapter 7, of course, verse 9 and 10, there is this scene that uh, is talking about somebody seated on the throne and there is fire everywhere. And, you know, so it creates, it's, it creates a bit of fear and insecurity, doesn't, doesn't it? And I think most Christians realize that uh, or they believe that uh, their, their works is going to determine their um, eternal destiny, which is not right. But here we want to find out this pre-advent judgment uh, of the believers uh, in the light of the gospel, the everlasting gospel. It's supposed to be good news. Uh, Brother Solon, could you could we put uh, the, the, the first one? This is... Uh, this is the great controversy. Those who share the benefits of the Savior's medi mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display or to gain seeking, should be devoted to honest, prayerful study of the word of, tr of, the word of truth. This is what is important. The subject of the sanctuary, that's one, and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All knowledge, all need and knowledge for themselves of the position and work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it would be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save, all to lose. Each has a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate often the solemn sin of the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened when with Daniel, every individual must stand in his lot at the end of the days. My sister wife is telling us that it's very important for you and I to understand. She's talking about two um, doctrines that we have, the sanctuary and the judgment. But obviously when we're talking about the judgment, we know very well that also have the sanctuary in mind, isn't it? 
Now that's another story that we, we another topic that we don't want to go. Now, obviously, if you have been in a different church in different de denomination, you've got an idea of how our brothers and sisters look at us as Adventists. You know, especially when we talk about pre-Advent judgment. Okay, so I'll give you a quote from uh, I don't know whether whoever has read this, Walter Martin. Walter Martin, uh, he's uh, the author of the Kingdom of the Cults, because obviously they, they look at us as one of the cults, isn't it? Jehovah Witnesses, who's the other one? Mormons, who's the other one? Christian Science and Seventh Adventists. So they believe we will four cults. And when they're in their theological schools, when they are studying, they normally look at the four um, denominations as cults. So this is what he writes. Yeah, page 479, if you can Google that. Holding as they do to the doctrine of investigative, in the investigative judgment, referring to Seventh Adventists, it is extremely difficult for us evangelicals, okay, to understand how they, the Seventh Adventists, can experience the joy of salvation and the knowledge of sins forgiven. Can you see that, uh, of course, he doesn't understand that uh, we understand what the judgment is all about. We know the judgment is about good news, isn't it? No, it's not to condemn us. It shows us that God loves us, isn't it? Again, if we look at the sanctuary and the judgment, yes, God loves us. Because like we were speaking in the lesson, we know very well, so a bit of uh, Adventist history uh, or doctrine. So right now we know that Christ is, where is Christ right now? Do we know? Do we know where Christ is at the moment? Where is he? He's in heaven, okay? Two, okay, whereabouts in heaven well, uh, do we believe he is? In the sanctuary, in the, in the holy place. In the holy place? In the most holy place, okay? What is he doing in the most holy place? He's acting as advocate for you and I, isn't he? In other words, he's pleading on your behalf and mine. Are we together? He is pleading on your behalf and mine, which is very important, okay? So we know Christ is in the most holy place because we know he's in the most holy place because he moved from the holy place to the most holy place. When did he move there? 1844, thank you, brothers and sisters. So if Christ is our advocate, what is he talking about? What is he advocating about? Sins, my brothers and sisters, okay? Our sins, because don't forget, when Christ is in the most holy place, we remember when there was the earthly sanctuary, when the high priest, because he's a high priest right now, when the high priest was in the most holy place, what was he doing in the most holy place when the high priest? He was cleansing the sanctuary, wasn't he? And that used to be done every what? Every day on over atonement, on the day of atonement. Are we together? So we believe that Christ is there, okay? So he's pleading for, on your behalf. Because he knows that Satan is on your back. Are we together? So as much as he's pleading, okay, there, can, there has to come a time when the investigation will, what? will end. And after that, then judgment will be passed, isn't it? And then after that, he'll come down and do what? And take you, who has been found to be what? Faithful. Are we together? Simply put it, you want to complicate things. So what other Christians fail to realize is that changing their behavior from bad to good doesn't change our nature. And I repeat that, even if we change our behavior from bad to good, what is our nature? We go to S. It's a sinful nature. Are we together? 
It doesn't change. But we know that when Christ comes back, when is that nature going to be changed? When these bodies, when he comes? When Christ comes, Mm -hmm. it will be sealed. And then when Christ stands from the, uh, from the, from the sanctuary, yeah? Yes. Then who is sinful will remain sinful. Who is holy will remain holy. Yes, but when the transformation of our bodies. Yes. Yes. Because we believe there is three Formations that transformation that we've got to go through. There is justification because he's, part, he's, he's, he's died for you and I. There is sanctification. There is a daily walk with Christ. Are we together? And then the last one is glorification. Have you heard of that word before? Yes. yes. When you glorified, in other words, your body will be turned to what? To the original body that who had? Adam. Okay. When Christ comes. That's the last thing that's going to happen. So we have a sinful nature, okay? Even after probation closes, that has to happen because that's biblical. That has to happen. That means that when Christ comes, that this body will put on. Okay, thank you very much, my brother. So Jesus saves you because he loves you, doesn't it? Hmm? And God forgives you because of what Jesus what, did for you um, on the cross. It's not because of where you go to church. It's not because you're the elder of the church. It's not because you're born in the church. But why? Why does Jesus forgive you? Or why does God forgive you? Okay, because we believe in Jesus Christ. So, so the ultimate test for us is not about what we are doing, okay? The ultimate test is not what we are doing. The ultimate test is us accepting the free gift that Jesus has given us. Have you accepted Jesus Christ in your, in your life? The reason we're going this way is we're, going, we're driving at something. And it's got to do with the judgment. So the ultimate test is whether you have accepted the free gift that Jesus has given you. Are we together? So when you accept Jesus Christ, when you accept his gift that he's given you, then when God sees you, he doesn't see who? You. Whom does he see? Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. Let us look at the objective facts of the judgment. Now, this happened in two people. When we read Romans chapter 5, verse 15, if you can put it up for us, Romans chapter 5, verse 15. This happened in two people. And for, the, for those of us who have read Romans, you've got an idea of what we're talking about here. Yes, Romans chapter 5, verse 15. So we've got two people here. We've got Jesus, we've got Adam, and we've got Jesus. And that's why sometimes Jesus is called the what? The second Adam. Thank you. Okay. He says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense one many, one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, have abounded unto many. In simple terms, it's telling us that one man did something and then we're all condemned. Are we together? When Adam sinned, we're what? All condemned. But then when Jesus obeyed, whom did he obey? His father in heaven. We all became what? We, come, we all came into eternal life. Are we together with that? Yes. So it is 
In other words, with Adam, there's nothing we can do about it. It is something that we inherit. Are we together? Yeah, because when, Jesus, when Adam sinned, God did not create any other beings. We are all from Adam. That's why babies die. Did you realize that? Yeah, because sin led to death, isn't it? So now when Jesus died for you and I, then we have the surety of eternal life. So it depends. Who, which life do you want to live? Do you want to live the Adam life? There's going to be constant condemnation. Or do you want to live a Christ life, which gives you everlasting life? Are we together? So, once we know that, because if we know that Adam's sin affected all human life and brought condemnation and death to all mankind, and Christ obeyed, therefore he brought the effect and he brought light, which is the effect of justification unto life. So the difference that we have is that in Adam, we did inherit, but what Christ did is a gift that has to be received. And God, God, Christ, is good, Christ is good, because he doesn't force himself on us, okay? But he's given us a gift, and that gift is what? Everlasting life, okay? So our eternal destiny depends on which humanity we choose. And my brothers and sisters, I'm praying that you and I choose the correct humanity. And that humanity is the one for Jesus Christ. Are we together? So, by faith in Christ, our subjective experiential status immediately changes from death to life, which came from who? Death to life came from who? From Adam. Our experiential status, okay, immediately changes from death to life, from condemnation to justification. So let's read John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. John chapter 5, verse 24. Okay. Verily, verily, I say unto you. So that, those words, verily, are like, I guarantee. How many people can guarantee nowadays? Very few people. But here, those words about uh, Jesus Christ, by the way, I guarantee you that he that heareth my word and believe on him that sent me has everlasting life. Okay. And shall not come into condemnation. Okay. But is passed from death unto life. So when you hear Jesus Christ and you believe in him that sent him, you have what? You are not coming to condemnation, but you'll be passed from death to life. Are we together? So remember, remember, this conversion does not exempt you from the judgment of Christ. Because the Bible has told us that we shall all be what? Judged. We read the quote, Sister Ellen G. White's quote, that we shall all what? Stand in our own what? Slots. Even us believers, you know? Because many Christians believe that um, there'll be no, they, won't, they won't be affected by the judgment because they've already been justified by Christ. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that before? Yeah, why, why are we going to be judged? No, we are not. So Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Is the one that tells us that. So here Paul is writing the believers, isn't it? In Rome. Okay. And we as Christians, we as human beings, we like judging, isn't it? Yeah. Because we're not the same culture, not, we're not the, it's not the same education, we're not, you're not as wealth as me. So many, so much from our background. We want, we like judging, isn't it? But here, Paul is telling them, why do you judge your brother? Okay? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand 
before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, we cannot judge one another, can we? Why can't we judge one another? Can somebody tell me? You do not know what is in the heart of a brother or sister. Can you imagine? God saw Paul, who was Saul, before, who was Saul in, in Greek, isn't it? He saw him. But what was Saul? He was a murderer, wasn't he? But God saw his heart. And he saw that, yes, also, although he is doing that, his heart is right. So all I have to do is have to change him. And then he met him on the road of what? The road to Damascus. And then he became one of the greatest evangelists in the Bible, isn't it? So my brothers and sisters, we cannot judge our brothers and sisters because we don't know what is in their hearts. Okay? So this judgment, okay, of believers must take place before Christ can legally take us to heaven. And men believe that the judgment of believers will take place the second time Christ comes. Have you heard of that before? That when Christ comes in, he'll judge us. No, he cannot. Because don't forget that he's coming as, what, is, what does the Bible tell us Christ is coming as? To take us, but why is he coming as? King and conqueror, isn't it? Yes. So he's gonna be judging you there. So he's coming as king and conqueror because the judgment is finished. Are we together? So he's coming as king and what? Conqueror. That's what the Bible tells us. So we know very well. That's why we call this pre-advent judgment. Pre, before, advent, coming, judgment, which is a judgment that will take place. So when comes Christ, when Christ comes, he's coming as king and conqueror. So, and this is good news because we know very well that Christ is our advocate in heaven. But when he's coming, what is going to come as? Our king, our judge, isn't it? Can you see that? And the lesson we said, well, this is beautiful. This is a win win situation. If our advocate is our judge, are we going to lose the case? No, we're not. But don't forget, somebody is accusing you and I, isn't it? And who is that? Satan. Satan is accusing somebody else. Who is he accusing? God, Jesus Christ, isn't it? That God is unfair. That's why the judgment has to take place, to qualify you and I to be able to have a rightful ownership in heaven. Are we together? Now, the Bible has got two groups of scripture that normally when we read them, we find ourselves, wait a minute, there's a contradiction. Because we know very well, one scripture says, one group of scripture says, we are ju- we, we, we're saved by what? What are we saved by? Faith. Our faith, okay? <laughs> but then you have read again that we are going to be judged according to our what? Works. So then you ask yourself, so how, what's going to happen there? Okay. So if you read Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Okay. Straight away, Paul says it as it is. There is, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Are we together? It's straightforward. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. And most of these uh, um, uh, scriptures have been written by the same man. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Again, there, we are judged by what? By faith, but not by what? By our works. Okay? And then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. So this is just to understand, yes, this is what the Bible is saying. These are not uh, stories that uh, we are, I'm coming up with. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. And what? It is a gift of God. 
And then the last one is going to be Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by your works of righteousness, which, you, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So these scriptures are telling us we are saved by what? Faith. But then there's another group of scripture which tells us that we'll be judged by our works. So if we look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Let's read this. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Hello? Okay, let's look at John chapter 5. Yes, verse 28 to 29. That's Christ saying, by the way, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are, all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth, okay? Those who have done good, done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to resurrection of condemnation. Who is speaking here? Who is speaking here? Who, <laughs> who is speaking here, brothers and sisters? Jesus. Jesus. Are we together? Okay, good, my brother. So we can read another one. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Again, here the theme is, re is re repeated. We are all going to appear before the judgment. Are we together? That each one will receive the things that things they've done in the body. Are we together? Not hard, not say, but done according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Excuse me. So, we ask ourselves, what is the Bible trying to tell us? The Bible is trying to say, look, yes, both, script, both groups of scriptures are spiritually inspired. Are we together? And do we agree with that? Yes. So that means it's trying to tell us something else. It's trying to tell us that genuine justification by faith has to be followed by what? By works. Can I repeat that? Genuine justification by faith has to be followed by works. Are we together? Let's look at John chapter 14, verse 12. John 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me and who the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these, he will do. Because I go to my father. Yes, here Jesus is telling you. Yes, if you have got genuine justification by faith, what's going to follow you? The works, okay? But what works are those? Good works. Are we, are we together, brothers and sisters? Good works. Now, we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. But let's read 8, 9, and 10 this time. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10. Also, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of your souls, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, okay, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Are we together? So in other words, Genuine justification by faith has to be followed by what? By works. Are we together? Read the last one, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 8. Titus chapter 3. Ch Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 8. So again, I think we read this through. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. This is a faithful saying, 
And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to what? To maintain what? Good works, that these things are good and profitable to men. One, these things are not for the believer. Who are they for? What are your good works for? For the people. Are we together? Yes. If you have, if you really have genuine je faith, uh, justification by faith, your works will be evident to those who see you. You'll be compassionate. You know Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23? Those fruits of the Spirit will be evident in your lives. Nobody will ask you to come early here. Nobody will ask you to spare, to, 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 to give to the, to, to the work of, of God to be able to progress, you know? Because why? Because your faith, which you've been justified, you know, is the good works that you're doing. We know very well about somebody in the Bible. Abraham. Abraham is the father of the what? Father of what? Father of what? Faith, my brothers and sisters. We know the, the faith scripture. Do we know where the faith scripture is? Or the faith chapter in Hebrews? Faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Are we together? Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. Do we know the history of Abraham? Because really this is going to show us that yes. So God comes to Abraham and tells him that, look, this Genesis chapter 15 or 14, I think. God, tell, God tells him, look, leave this place and go somewhere else. Does he linger about? No. He goes. But before he goes, he tells him that you're going to do what? You're going to be a father of many what? Nations. So after some time, we're talking about eight, ten years, no child. Are we together? After eight years, actually, God, uh, Abraham, God comes to Abraham and says, why do you doubt what I told you? I, I promised you, you're going to be the father of many children. Do we know how many children he's going to have? Those who remember. Do you know how many children God showed him he's going to have? He told him, go outside and look where? The stars. Are we together? Ten years, no child. And yet I'm going to have, a, you know? So obviously, Abraham was, wait a minute, what's happening here? So the culture then was when, what? The one who is in your house, the one who is like the leader in your house is going to be taking your inheritance. And we know that this person's name, what was the person's name that was in Abraham's house? That he was worried that he's going to take his inheritance. Eliezer, you remember him? Yes. Because here is Abraham saying, what is the child? I don't have a, somebody to take over my inheritance. This servant, Eliezer, is going to take everything. And God says, no. The child that's going to inherit your goods is going to be who? From your loins. Do you remember that? We don't have to go up back there. So he says, yes, that's fine. Then two more years, and then no. What does Sarah tell him? I think, I think, I, I'm trying to think that God, Sarah, Sarah must have told him, I think God only meant you to have a child, not through me. And what does she suggest? Go to my what? Go to my maid. Let her have a surrogate father, uh, child, and then you help God to have a child. And of course, we know who was born then? Who was born from uh, Abraham and Hagar? Ishmael, are we together? But we know very well that that's not the child that really God wanted. Now, God has to show Abraham that, look, you need to believe in me because I made a promise. And this is what I want also to encourage you. When God makes a promise, he comes through. Are we together? Because we know very well he made a promise at the foundation of the what? Of the creation, didn't he? That he will send you and I a what? A savior. And if you feel that 2,000 years ago, isn't it? So please, believe in God. 
if he says something, he means it. So we can see that obviously Isaac wasn't born. But then we can see, when, 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 do we know when Isaac was born? How old was Abraham? 100? And how, was, how old was Hagar? We're talking about 90 years. So it was impossible, impossible for them to have a child. Can you see how good God is? So Abraham has who? Isaac with Sarah. And Isaac, what do, we, what do we call Isaac in the Bible? Child of laughter. Yes, I know. It's child of laughter. Because, well, it was an impossibility. Because God wanted to show Adam, Abraham, that look, if I make a promise, I fulfill that promise. And I know God has fulfilled many promises for yours and my lives. Even when we can see no way out, gold has actually come through for us. So after Isaac is born, we see how many years later, about 16 or 17, then God asked Isaac, uh, Abraham, do what? Sacrifice that child. Now, which one of your parents would actually understand what God was talking about there? But what does Abraham do? Does this... Uh, Refuse? No. But do you know that was a test? Okay. So if we read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 to 19, that was a test. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, that word begotten of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. That word begotten is not the same as Jesus Christ. Because you see, English is, that's what it, 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 it does. It just puts the word there. And then you need to go back and find out what does really this begotten mean? Begotten here in terms of in context of what we are doing, we're reading here is a special child. Isaac was a special child because nobody knew how he was born. So was Jesus begotten, he was also a special child. But we know very well that this eyes, this here, the begotten here means special. But the begotten Jesus Christ means what? The one like him, the one like God. Are we together? So here we can see that. Abraham has got a child. God says, sacrifice him. Abraham doesn't hesitate because why? We've been told. We've been told why? Go, on, uh, go to 18. For whom you say it was? Yes, go to 19. God was able. So Abraham believed that God was able to do what? To raise him up. Even what? From the dead. That's a type of faith, my brothers and sisters, we need to pray for. That's the type of faith. I mean, most of us have got more than one children. I'm sorry if you've got one child. But even sacrificing, even something happened with that child. Can you feel that like your heart is really hurting, isn't it? But here he's only got one child. No, he's got two. But this special one, God says, give him back to me. And doesn't hesitate because he believed that what? That he raised him from the dead. So that is the type of faith that you and I have to have. Not only that, that type of faith, can you see? It has got wax with it, hasn't it? Because when God asked Abraham to sacrifice his child, did he hold back? No, he was going to do it. That's the type of faith we're talking about. That's the justification by faith. It has to be followed by what? By works. Don't get me wrong. Even Christ has said that these works are sometimes what? They're not the same. Sometimes 30 fold, sometimes 60 fold, sometimes what? Yeah, because if you just come to the faith, oh, sometimes it's too much for you. You can't bear it. But genuine justification has to be followed by what? By works. 
and we know very well that Jesus Christ will be able to help us in terms of, in terms of uh, crisis. We just have to let him. We just have to let him. Don't look at Abraham's situation and say, oh, wait a minute. I don't think I can get to that. No. Because the Bible tells us that God actually cannot what? Give you a burden more than you can what? Bear. Can you see how loving it is? Can you see how loving it is? So would you too want somebody like that to be your judge, your advocate? So now everybody should be rejoicing, saying, Father in heaven, thank you very much. Thank you. We don't care. We don't even care about death. Because we know you are a faithful God. You are both our judge and our advocate. All we need to do is to take the gift that God has given us. To receive the gift. Are we together? So I pray that when we talk about the judgment, we don't look at God as somebody who is vindictive, okay? Somebody who is retributive, okay? But somebody who loves you and I, because the Bible tells us God is love. It doesn't talk about one of his attributes. No, it says God is love, period. Are we together? So I pray, my brothers and sisters, that today, when we read Daniel chapter 7, verse 9 to 10, we're not scared. We are actually saying, Father in heaven, when is our turn coming? Because we know that we are going to be resting Jesus Christ. It's going to be just a momentary what? Momentary rest. And by the way, when you have got that attitude, it has to be ex uh, ex exhibited in what? In your works. You will encourage others. They'll be coming to ask you, how is it that you have, how is it that you've gone through that? Are we together? And that's why you and I come to church to encourage one another. Are we together? So that when we go out there, we can witness that the God we serve is a God of love and a God of so much mercy. Thank you very much for listening. Amen.